Praise the Lord. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Isn't that wonderful? Praise God. Well, let's get ready to sing together. And uh, I encourage you to get a songbook and join right in. Brother Jesse Edwards is coming to lead us in the singing. And as he does, you feel free to join right in as we sing to the Lord. Amen. Good morning. I encourage you to turn in your songbooks to song number 442. 442. It's blessed assurance. Assurance means the full confidence, full confidence, free from doubt, freedom from doubt. And I'm thankful that we can have a confident, we can have confidence knowing that Jesus is our is ours. He's our personal savior to us. And I'm so thankful that we can have that assurance. Oh, no. 
that chorus again. Oh, this is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my That is your testimony this morning, that you have that confidence within your heart that he is yours, and that, that story that he has written in your life, that transformation that he wrought in our life, I'm so thankful for the transformation that he can do, and the peace that he can give, all through his redeeming love. I encourage you to turn back to song number 109, and singing about our wonderful Savior, and how we can have that full confidence in him and we want to sing about how great our savior is this morning
God, that was good singing. Thank you, Jesse, for leading those very good songs today. And as uh, we prepare our hearts for prayer today, I uh, I want to have Brother Charlie prepare to lead us in prayer in just a little while. But um, as we do, let me give you a few uh, requests that we can join our hearts and our minds together in prayer for today. Uh, first of all, let's continue to pray for the people in Ukraine. A lot of sad things happening over there, although God has been at work. I shared with you a week ago a letter that I downloaded from our friends there in Ukraine, um, the Sobies, and uh, they were praising God as they have seen God's hand of protection there for them, and as she shared, as I read last Sunday, she had actually had shared just uh, the Saturday before, so about uh, eight days ago, how that God had been providing even for their groceries. While all the supermarkets in their area are empty, there's nothing. You know, we get a little concerned. You go to the grocery store after a forecast of snow and all the bread and milk is gone, but there's usually at least a few other things. But she said all the supermarkets are completely closed. There's nothing there. But uh, God has been providing from the fact that farmers have been bringing things in and setting up little booths there. And people, as she said, there's been plenty of food to go around. So she was praising God. And we take so many things for granted, but uh, she was praising God for the help God was giving. And uh, I also know that even this week, God has continued to protect them. And in fact, uh, some of the uh, troops... Uh, have been removing and moving back east. That's that's good for those from the area where they are that are not uh, so closely focused on now, even though we still need to pray for those in the eastern area where they're going back to. But let's just continue to pray for them. God knows what's going on. He's not taken by surprise, and we need to pray. There's many of our brothers and sisters over there in the Lord, and uh, they're continuing to meet. They're sometimes meeting in homes. We're free to worship as we are here today. They're meeting in homes. They're meeting in places, sometimes in basements, just to be away from the danger of overhead shelling. And so we need to thank God that we are able to come together as we are today. Also, uh, in our praying, uh, mentioned last Sunday, we want to continue to pray for Brother Cliff, who, as I understand, has at this point scheduled 
cataract surgery for the 13th. And so let's pray for him um, and pray that God will give him a peace about that and also those that will be conducting the surgery, that God will help them. We want to keep praying for Sister Ruth. I did have communication with her today, and uh, she is still not feeling real well. We miss her from our midst, but let's uh, just keep doing our part to pray for her, our sister in the Lord. Also, Brother Bill Ames, let's keep him in our prayers. He need us, needs our prayers. And we've been praying for uh, Gerald's daughter-in-law, Sheila, who is not doing very well in a fight against cancer. Uh, let's just pray for her and his son, Billy, that God will help them. Also praying for Jim Swingley, who had a fall a little over a week ago and is still recovering from that. And, you know, God cares about all of these. I'm, uh, I'm missing a couple of my own family members this morning. Little J.C. is not feeling well today, and so we miss her and Adi. And uh, also my daughter-in-law, Brittany, was sick last night and having some kind of a stomach virus. And so we miss her and Joel today, but let's pray for Brittany and pray for little JC. God cares about all of these needs, whether it's serious or rather simple. God cares about all of the needs. And so let's remember these. Let's remember this service today, that God will direct and anoint in every aspect of it that is yet to come. I'm sure some of you may have some uh, unspoken requests you'd just like to manifest with an uplifted hand. I see hands all across the audience. God cares about and knows about these. And uh, so I invite you, if you're physically able, to stand. Brother Charlie is coming forward to uh, lead us in prayer. And as he does, you feel free to join right in as we talk to the Lord. our voices together. Our Father, we thank you so much this morning for the blessing of being in your house. We thank you for traveling mercies. We thank you for the anticipation that we have coming into your presence and just believing what you're going to have for us this morning. And Lord, we are thankful that as was already shared that we can come before you and and uh, worship you in spirit and in truth of you, as you have requested that we do. And Lord, today we are very blessed to be able to do that in public and not to uh, have to hide in a shelter somewhere in the basement, but Lord, we have the freedom to worship you as we so see so fit to do. Lord, you are aware of all the requests that have been shared here today. Lord, you know the many physical needs that have been shared. Lord, we think of Cliff today. I pray that you would help him. You know the uncertainty of, of how things can go, but Lord, we are glad that you have given men, the uh, men and women, the uh, know how how to do these surgeries, and I pray that you would bless him and help him during this process. Lord, we continue to think of Bill Ames this morning. Lord, we miss his presence here among us. He's always a very positive person, and we miss him, but Lord, continue to help him in this recovery process. We know it's been a long road, but we know that you have been faithful and help him today. Keep him encouraged in the things of God. We think of Ruth, Lord. She's also someone that we miss very very much in our midst. She's always, as it were, kind of a spark plug to us. And Lord, always positive, always smiling, always full of faith. But Lord, we miss her. Continue to help her. Lord, bring her through this, as it were, with flying collars. Lord, we pray. You know of the, you know of uh, Jim Swingley today. Lord, we've had the opportunity to meet him once. And Lord, you know his physical needs this morning. And you are the great physician. And Lord, you still heal in this day, and that we're very thankful for. And help him, Lord, in his recovery time. We think of uh, we think of Sheila Swingley today as well, Lord. You know her, and you know all about her. And I pray that your healing touch would be extended to her this morning as we pray. And Lord, continue to help uh, those who are sick. Lord, we think of J.C. We think of Brittany. I pray that you would help them today. And Lord, may they feel your encouraging touch and uh, bring them through. We pray. Lord, you know all of us who have uh, um, unsaved loved ones that we would like to see get saved. Lord, we tend to focus many times on the healing, but Lord, more important is that which is in the spiritual realm. And I pray that you would help each one today, Lord, to feel the convicting power of the Holy Spirit upon them. 
You know the uns the unspoken request. Be with each one of them today, and Lord, be with be with uh, the service that continues on. Lord, meet with us in a very special way, and continue to bless. And may your Holy Spirit be uh, lifted up in each one of our hearts as we worship together today. We ask these things in your name. Amen. As we uh, had been announcing for several weeks, uh, yesterday was our mid-year conference at Westfield, and I want to thank the Lord for the way that he helped us and gave us a good day, and uh, we were blessed with God's presence in the morning service and then a great and wonderful meal we enjoyed together, and uh, we also... We're blessed to be a part of the afternoon event for the local church there at Westfield. Union Friends was celebrating an amazing event in their life uh, in paying off their family life center and having a mortgage burning ceremony. And it was just a great day in the Lord. and We appreciated that opportunity. And um, so we're uh, thankful for how God has helped and directed. But uh, as we look forward in this service today, we are... Uh, always happy to hear from various ones of the congregation. We have been blessed, so blessed to have many that are talented musically and able to share with us and be a part of the ministry. And this morning, we have uh, Stephen and Jessica Nix and maybe some of their family. I'm not sure who all is coming, but whoever is on the agenda, just go ahead and come forward as uh, you come to share with us today. Let's give prayerful attention. Just why he ever loved me so He looked beyond all my faults And saw my need I shall Marvel. 
my falling soul. He looked beyond my faults and saw my need. If not for grace, my soul would be a drifting ship with no safe harbor from the angry waves. But Calvary's cross shines brightest through the darkest storm and just in time his mercy rescued me and I shall forever lift my eyes to sounded pretty hearty to me. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I, I love the thoughts of all that they sang, but that phrase, how marvelous that he was there to catch my falling soul. He looked beyond my faults and he saw my need. Praise God. Thank you again for that beautiful and meaningful song. As I mentioned earlier, we had mid-year conference yesterday and a part of the blessing of the day was that Dr. Michael Williams was able to bring his wife and drag her all the way from Seal, Alabama to come up to the north, you know, up here where it's not quite as warm. He left 74 degrees down there to come up to whatever it was yesterday, which was not 74, and um, become a part of uh, that event. And I said, you know what, I'd like for you to preach for us at Randolph in the morning. So I got a surprise for you, a good surprise. Dr. Michael Williams is coming to preach for us at this time. And uh, you just give him your attention, and I know God will help you. And the children that want to go to their time of Bible study right now may be dismissed to do so if you so desire. And uh, the rest of you, get ready to follow along in your Bibles and receive what God has for us today. Amen. Well, good morning and thank you, Brother Jonathan. I guess I'm like the preacher who said, before I preach, I want to say something. Uh, I've always uh, really appreciated, of course, Randolph. In fact, um, I was sitting thinking, this church, not this building, but over in the old church, was the first church that I ever pastored. And I sort of cut my professional eye teeth, I guess, there. Uh, and have a lot of good memories. 
Uh, we're also, uh, we're so happy with Brother Jonathan and Sister Lori stopped by our place in uh, Alabama there in January. It was really a breath of fresh air for us, and we so much enjoyed their visit. As he mentioned, uh, we left some warm weather behind and came north, and yesterday it dawned on me before I got up, I, I told him, I said, you know, you all know about snowbirds that leave the cold north and come south. And we did the, we left the warm south and came north. What am I, a cuckoo bird? <laughs> you know, maybe so, I don't know. But uh, we do appreciate the warm hospitality. And uh, I really enjoyed that duet. That was, that was very wonderful. Thank you. And I enjoyed the Sunday school lesson. Wasn't that good? My. Uh, of course, you know, Brother Dave and I became good friends over in Israel uh, two and a half years ago, whatever, and he was the designated driver, and I was a navigator, and we had a nice couple in the back, and during that time, I became a real prayer warrior, <laughs> you know. I wondered if maybe he had ever trained to drive in the Indy 500, but <laughs> I don't know, but we made it fine and, and uh, had some great times there. Well, I want to share with you a passage of scripture in Luke's gospel, chapter 12. And uh, the other day I was reading in my devotions, actually, and it's quite interesting. You know, sometimes uh, you read and you think about what you're reading, and, and, uh, but other times it seems like it just kind of leaps off the page at you. <laughs> and that happened, and I thought, oh, wow. And I began to kind of refocus on that passage and think about it, and I feel like the Lord kind of gave me some thoughts, and I wrote them down. So we're going to uh, look at this passage in Luke chapter 12, beginning with verse 22 in just a moment. Before we do, let's bow again in prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for your wonderful presence that has warmed our hearts this morning for all that has been said and done. And we pray, Lord, that as we look at your word, that you will open it to our minds and to our hearts. May the Holy Spirit himself, who authored this word, enlighten it. And for all that you do, we'll give you praise. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, beginning with uh, verse 22, uh, Luke says, And he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, neither for your body what you shall put on. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? And which of you, with taking thought, can add to his stature one cubit? If ye then be not able to do that which is the least, why take ye thought for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow, they toil not, they spin not. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothe the grass which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? And seek not what ye shall eat, nor what ye shall drink, neither be ye of doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after. And your Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. But rather, but rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Amen. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. The story is told of a little old lady, 95 years old, who was in the nursing home, and she was visited by a younger lady who was a member of the church, and she said, well, how are you doing? And she said, oh, I am just worried sick, and that sort of surprised the younger lady, and she said, well, you seem to be feeling all right. Oh, I feel fine. Well, are they treating you well here? Oh, yes, they treat me very well. Well, why are you so worried? And she said, well, all of my closest friends have gone on to heaven, and I'm still here, and I'm just worried sick that they're wondering what happened to me. <laughs> well, it seems like people always have things to worry about. What do you worry about? What is it that fills your 
mind and your heart with anxiety. Uh, it seems to me that almost many, many, far too many of God's people today are filled with anxiety, fears, uh, discouragements, and anxiety. And so uh, I want to go back and just kind of give you the background of this uh, passage. Earlier in this chapter, uh, in verse 13, we read about a man who said to Jesus, he said, speak to my brother that he will divide the inheritance with me. Well, Jesus very quickly let him know that that was not something he was interested in doing at all. And, of course, the Lord always knows what is behind every situation. And he begins to talk about covetousness. Maybe we are to infer that this man might have had some covetousness. But he said, um, take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things, and notice that word things, which he possesseth. And then he proceeds to give them a parable of what is called the rich fool. A farmer. A farmer who was blessed abundantly by God. The rains fell in abundance when they needed them. And uh, the sun shone brightly and God blessed his crops. And he had a bumper crop. And you remember he said, oh, what am I going to do? I know what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns, and I never quite could figure that out, but <laughs> to build bigger barns. And the Lord said to him, you fool, you fool. Well, when God calls you a fool, that's serious business, friend. He said, you fool, this night your soul will be required of you. And well, what did this man do that was so bad that God would call him a fool? Well, I think it was not so much maybe what he did as what he failed to do. You know, the great commandment is that we love God with all of our heart, soul, strength, and mind. And, he said, your neighbors yourself. And here was a man who was blessed of God and he never gave thanks to God at all. Never, never once looked up to heaven and said, thank you, Lord. Not only that, but he showed no love for his neighbor. He was totally self-focused. That's why God said, you're a fool. Any man or woman that would live to himself or herself, is a fool. And so, having said that, then we come to this passage where Jesus turns and speaks specifically to his disciples. And in verses 22 through 27, he talks about their daily life. Well, it's interesting sometimes, isn't it, to just think about our life, day by day. And... Then in uh, verses 28 through 30, he expresses some divine logic. And finally in verse 31, he gives them some different laws. So that's kind of my little outline of where I'd like to, to go with this. But notice he begins uh, talking about our material problems, our daily life. And uh, I came to the realization some years ago, there are kind of two classes of people. The have, you're the haves and the have-nots, the rich and the poor. Now, we understand that that is a relative term. I mean, it's kind of like the other says to one another, his friend, how's your wife? He said, compared to who? Well, that's probably not a good way to answer, but uh, there are absolutes in the world, but there are also some relative things. And he said, well, I, I'm certainly not rich. Well, compared to probably the world's majority, you are rich. If you have an automobile, and how, I mean, you go to India, Africa, places like that, they would say, wow, you are very rich. Then you would look at someone like perhaps Bill Gates or someone and, and say, oh, wow, I'm not rich at all. It, it's relative. But at the same time, there are a certain element of truth of being wealthy and not being poor. And I was thinking about that, and the fact is Jesus experienced both of those. I mean, think of it. He had the wealth of the creation. He made everything. All things were made by him, we're told, and without him was not anything made that was made. And everything belongs to him, and he lived in heaven. 
And the songwriter talked about that he came out of the ivory palaces. I mean, can you imagine the beauty of heaven? That's, that was where, and he enjoyed the splendor, the wealth of heaven. But he became poor to ransom our soul. He experienced poverty. He never owned a house. Never, as far as we know, he never even had a donkey. He had to borrow a donkey to ride into Jerusalem. Really, all that he ever had was the clothes on his back, and they took that from him and gambled over it. He had nothing. So poor. And both kinds of people, and this is the point I want to make, have problems. You know, people that don't have anything, oh, I got all these problems. How am I going to pay the mortgage? How am I going to pay, you know, and boy, if I had a lot of money, I wouldn't have any problems. Well, I've been around some people that had a whole lot of money, and guess what? They had problems. <laughs> and I realized that having a lot of money didn't keep them from having rebellious children sometimes, having health problems. And they many times were worried about the stock market and, you know, all keeping what they, they had problems, kept them up at night. So problems are kind of inherent in humanity. And Jesus recognized that in his followers. And so he says to them, take no thought, therefore, what you shall eat and what your body shall eat. Now, this is interesting because here in verses, verse 22, there is pressure acknowledged. Jesus recognizes that life has pressures. To, to pay your bills, to put food on the table, to do all these things. And every time you drive up to the gas tank, there's pressure, right? <laughs> More pressure than it was last week, it seems. And uh, every time you go to get groceries, if what you want is on the shelf, which it may not be, <laughs> it's gone up a little bit. Everything goes up just about except our salary. And that creates pressure. Well, that's nothing new. They, they had it in Jesus' time. And, and so, but he acknowledges that pressure, and he says to them, uh, take no thought. Now, we know, of course, that what he's really saying, and every commentator will tell you this, and the original bears this out, do not be anxious. Take no distracting thought. Don't let you be, yourself be distracted uh, about all of these things. See? Because your Father knows that you need them. Now, obviously... He's not saying, never give it a thought. You know, just go ahead and get in your hammock and drink lemonade and expect God to just to rain down manna on you. Uh, that won't happen. <laughs> he tells us in other places that we are to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. And, and we are to make plans for the future and so forth. But not to the point of being filled with care and anxiety. Oh me, oh my, what's going to happen when this takes place? Or, you know, on and on and on. But in verses 23 through 27, uh, there is a perspective that is totally altered. And this is what is so good. In Matthew's account, uh, the, the Lord three times, and Matthew has the same uh, incident and account here, but in that three times he tells him not to be filled with anxiety. Now, let me ask you, is being filled with doubt and anxiety a sin? Well, you say, oh, well, no. Well, I would agree. Perhaps not, but it may be. I mean, it, the point is we all tend to worry. Now, some people worry a whole lot more than other people, right? In fact, when we hadn't been married too long, and my wife said to me, well, you, you don't worry about anything. I said, well, why should I? You worry enough for both of us. I don't need to. <laughs> well, of course, the reality is anybody that has children probably worries at times, you know. Uh, especially when they're adolescents and you're watching the clock and the other eyes on the door and, oh, Lord, you're praying and, you know, you, you kind of live or die with your kids. But at the same time, uh, we don't have to be filled with anxiety. And he says, because really of three things, first of all, it's unnecessary. You don't need to be filled with care and concern and worry. And, and in fact, you know what worry, the word worry they tell us it comes from an old German word that means to choke or strangle. You get that connection? Anxiety can literally choke the happiness out of you. It can strangle the joy of living. And he said, don't do that. 
Well, again, do go back to my point. You may struggle with anxiety, but there comes a point where you simply have to trust the Lord or refuse to do that. And it's a matter of obedience or disobedience. And that would be a sin. If you say, hold me, and the Lord says, you know, casting all of our care upon him. Well, Lord, I can cast some of it, most of it. That's not obedience. We are commanded to cast all of our care, our anxiety. The songwriter said, all my anxiety, all my care, bring to the mercy seat, leave it there. And too often we take it, but then we take it back and live with it. And Jesus says, don't do that. You don't need to do that. That's not necessary. Not that, but it's not, it is unworthy. It is a reflection on the God that we profess to serve when we are filled with anxiety and care. It'd be like having a, a child that t- goes to all the neighborhood telling them, well, my daddy doesn't do this. He doesn't, he doesn't buy me a pair of shoes. I mean, that'd be a terrible day. Well, how do you know you needed shoes? Your mother never said, well, I'll buy you shoes. I'll buy you two or three pairs of shoes. But when you moan and groan and bellyache and refuse to trust God, it is a reflection on God. It's unworthy. And then he says it's unprofitable. What good does it do to worry? You know, I read a while back that one old, well, elderly gentleman said, you know, he said, as I look back on my life, I realize that most of the things I worried about never happened. What a waste. And in this passage here, verse 24, Jesus points, first of all, to the fowls of the air. And he said, you know, they don't worry about how they're going to be fed. They never have to make a reservation, stand in line for 45 minutes. To, you know. They don't do that. Um, you may have heard this little poem, Overheard in an Orchard. Said the robin to the sparrow, I should really like to know why these anxious human beings rush about and worry so. Said the sparrow to the robin, friend, I think that it must be that they have no heavenly father such as cares for you and me. Well, we do, but we just act like we don't have one, you see. Well, think about it. Probably there's no billionaire in the world that could afford to feed all the birds in the world for one day. (laughs) God does it every day, see. And you're worried? And he said, if he'll take care of the fowls, the sparrows, whatever kind of, he'll certainly take care of you. And then he looked secondly in verses 25 and 26 at the facts. He said, not, look not only at the fowls, but look at the facts. You, you can't, by worrying, make yourself taller. You can't live a moment longer than what God has already decreed you're going to live. I mean, those are pretty important things. And, and look at the facts. You can't change those. I mean, a lot of people would like to be, you know, 6'3 or 6'5 and have a great physique or whatever. And wishing and hoping and dreaming is not going to do it. <laughs> I mean, he was a little bit humiliated. My younger brother's three inches taller than I am. Like, he's still my little brother. <laughs> and, um, but look at the facts. Worrying doesn't change anything. And then he says in verse 27, look at the flowers, uh, how beautiful they are. And he said, even Solomon in all of his glory. And Solomon was undoubtedly the most, what, uh, uh, spectacular king of Egypt, I mean of, of Israel. You know, and, and he was the queen of Sheba comes up, she was just blown away. And she said, well, I heard all these reports, and I thought, well, those are obviously exaggerate." She said, The half was never yet been told. And part of that that was that Solomon was clothed in beautiful, beautiful garments. And yet Jesus said it doesn't compare to the little lilies. And we were in Israel. We saw a lot of flowers all over the walls and along the ways. And and perhaps the difference was that Solomon's beauty was put on from without. That kind of beauty of the flowers comes from within. And real beauty, I would remind you, true beauty always comes from within. You've heard the look, what is it? Pretty is as pretty does. <laughs> uh, beauty's only skin deep, but ugly goes clear to the bone. I, I grew up with a lot of things. <laughs> but 
God can beautify his people. And, you know, I have seen people, as I'm sure you have, that didn't impress me very much at first. But the longer I was around them, I became aware there was a beauty. Uh, just, uh, and the more you're around them, the more you wanted to be around them. There was just a, a joy and a radiance and just, that's the kind of beauty that comes from within, you see. Well, he goes on and he says here in verses 28 and 30, he speaks of a divine logic. Look what he says. He said, if God so clothe the grass which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast in the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? And seek not what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, neither be ye of doubtful mind. Now he says to them, O ye of little faith. Well, I'm glad he didn't say they didn't have any faith. <laughs> Apparently they had some. It was just little. It wasn't very much. And so... There's a gentle rebuke here, I think. And what he's saying to them is that, that uh, they have a halting faith, a very halting faith, uh, a deficient faith, if you will. And uh, he wants us to have a strong faith. He even says that they have a doubtful mind. And uh, the picture is that of a, uh, a little ship or boat that sets out in the, there are winds of adversity. But a wise captain knows how to trim his sails. Do you know that he can turn those sails in such a, an angle that the very winds of adversity become winds that can propel his ship forward? And so every trial, every battle, every concern, every point of anxiety can become a point of forward progress. God can make stepping stones out of stumbling stones. We don't have to be anxious and overly concerned. But he says not only do we have a too often a halting faith, but in verse 30 he says, Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Oh, I'm sorry, verse, back up, I was two verses ahead. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your father knoweth that ye have need of these things. So we have a heavenly father. Our faith may be halted at times, but it shouldn't be because we have a heavenly father who takes care of us. And you know, every father who has the heart of a father loves to give his children things that they need and many times things that they desire. And it says the Lord loveth to give us the desires of our heart. I remember one time when we were over in Westfield and and uh, the school was struggling, and because the school was struggling, we were struggling, and, and uh, it was things pretty, pretty tight and difficult. And uh, my one daughter, my middle daughter, had, uh, had done really well in school, and uh, actually won a trophy and so forth, and, and of course her mother and I were so proud of her. And I knew that she had really, really been wanting a bicycle, and... Uh, so we had somehow scraped and scrounged and <laughs> put a few dollars together. And I remember when the school got out, we went to, I think, I don't know if it was Walmart. It might have been Kmart in those days or wherever. But we walked in, and, and, um, and so I said to her, I started telling Michelle, we're so proud of you and your progress, how well you've done and worked so hard. And, and she was looking at me. I think she was about eight years old or nine years old. And, you know, all the big eyes, like, what, what, am I, what point am I getting to? And I said, I, your mother, I know that you've been wanting a bicycle. And we want you to go and pick out any bicycle in the store. And she looked like, this is surreal. It's like she was in a dream. Like, really? Yeah. And, of course, she got her bicycle, and she was so thrilled. But, you know, I think I was more thrilled than she was to be able to give my daughter Something that I knew she wanted so much. Well, that, I think, is a little picture of God's heart. God wants to meet your needs. And not just that, but give you the desires of your heart. Because he is a loving, compassionate, heavenly father. Last of all, verse 31, uh, Luke tells us, he says, Rather seek the kingdom of God and all these Again, things. He started in the beginning talking about things, coveting things that 
we shouldn't, that belong to somebody else. And he said, that's wrong, don't do that. But he said, I know you need things. And he said, I will provide the things that you need. And then he, now he says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. So I think there's a real little message just in that one verse. He's, when he says, seek ye, that means to pursue. To pursue tenaciously, with focus, with perseverance. Not just, oh, well, kind of lackadaisical. You know, Lord, I, I wouldn't do your will. I, you know, no. But pursue with passion. The will of, Lord, whatever your will is, that's what I want. I'll, we, we sing that song sometimes, you know, I'll go where you want me to go. Really? <laughs> I'll do what you want me to do. I'll be. Do we really, really mean that? I trust we do. But it, to pursue God's will in our life. And then he said, seek ye first. Well, that's priority. It, it, in other words, he, he recognizes it's fine to pursue other things. It's fine for a young man to pursue a wife. <laughs> Maybe for a wife to, or a young woman to pursue a husband. <laughs> That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. It's fine to pursue an education. It's fine to pursue other goals in life. God's not against that. He knows we're humans and we have motives. But he says, here's the key word, seek ye first. First. He has to come first. You remember when Elijah went up there at a time of drought and famine to that little widow? And she, he said, I, I'd like for you to bake me a cake. <laughs> oh, preacher, I'm sorry. I've got a little old handful of meal and uh, about a fourth of a cup of oil. And I got just enough for my son and me to have one last little old pancake here and it's all over. He said, go ahead and make me one first. Now that sounds rather selfish, but he represented God. And because she reordered her priorities, okay, prophet, preacher, I'll make yours first. And guess what? When she put God first, put his kingdom, his will first, she and her son had all that they needed. The oil didn't run out. <laughs> the flour kept running. Every day, there it is. And so God took care of all her needs and her son's needs because she sought first, not second or fourth, first the will of a priority. And then he said, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Well, that's the prize. <laughs> God's kingdom. What greater reward could there be than the prize, our home in the skies, eternal fellowship and communion with Jesus. Wow, what a prize. And then he said, all these things, you're worried about things, possessions, he said, they'll be added to you. And God's clocks keep perfect time. They really do. But God's never late. I'm kind of like God. He's, he's like to scare me to death a few times, but he came through, you know. He really did. And so uh, all that we need, he will give us his possessions. And he said, shall be added unto you. Yes. Not they may be, or hopefully, no, that's a promise a divine promise, they shall be added unto you. Well, I think that the Lord is very concerned and perhaps displeased at times when he sees his children so filled with anxiety and concerns that they really don't need to, to worry and to carry. And I want to close with this little fable, little illustration. There's an old fable about a clock that stood in the corner of a room, and uh, I noticed uh, being at Brother Jonathan and Mr. L uh, Sister Louise, they've got a nice clock. And they're like, click, click, and then it chimed on the tower, you know. Well, this clock was over in the corner of a room, busily ticking away the hours. And the clock began to think and began to worry. And the clock said to itself, you know, I tick once every second. Hmm. There are 60 seconds in a minute. And 60 minutes in an hour. Let's see, that means I have to tick 3,600 times every hour. And 
That means 86,400 times every day. Well, the clock's starting to get a little overwhelmed at that point, and he says, then there's tomorrow and the, the day after that and the weeks and months ahead. Why, he said, in a year's time, I will have ticked 31,536,000 times. And that clock began to get so discouraged. <laughs> and it added the burden of unborn days. Did you hear that? The burden of unborn days to the burden of the present moment of time. And it began to run more and more slowly till it almost came to a standstill, a stop. But then the clock had a sudden encouraging thought. He said, well, you know, actually, as I think further upon it, all I have to do really is just a tick at a time. <laughs> you know, with that insight, the clock gathered strength and carried on with its allotted task. Measuring the passing moments, one tick at a time. You think you can do that? <laughs> one tick at a time? I don't know about tomorrow. The songwriter said, I just live from day to day. I don't borrow from its sunshine, for its skies. What such a wonderful song. I don't know about the future. It may bring me pot. But the one that feeds the sparrows, he said, look at the fowls, is the one that cares for me. Oh, ye of little faith. Oh, ye of little faith. The Father knows what you need, and he loves to give you the wants, the desires of your heart. I will not allow my heart and my mind to be filled and consumed with anxiety. No, God's people should live joyfully, and every moment just ticking one tick at a time. <laughs> Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof, Jesus said. May it be so. Let's bow. Lord, we thank you again for your help. Thank you so much that you love us, you care for us, you provide our needs in such a wonderful way. And Lord, we, we just love serving you. You are a loving Heavenly Father. And we thank you that you lead God and direct us and we can roll all of our cares upon you. In times of anxiety and stress and frustration when the world would press in, we can just step back and roll all of our cares on your omnipotent shoulders, for you are God. Thank you. We praise you today for all that you do. We'll give you praise, for it's in your name we pray. Amen. Brother Jonathan.